panel today is called Chronic Engagement with Jews and Christians and Their Narratives. We have four panelists, each presenting their own papers. And following that, we'll have a respondent to offer his, his commentary, his opinions, his thoughts on the four papers we'll have heard. And when that concludes, I'll turn it over to questions at the end. And allow me to first introduce our first presenter, and that is Dr. Hammond, who is a civil engineer by profession and has published numerous research papers. He completed his doctorate from the University of Oklahoma and his interest in Islamic history and the Quran. Today, he will share his thoughts about interfaith dialogue. Uh, so let's welcome Dr. Hammond. communicating with each other. So that society 
will definitely experience the harmony and peace. They will have a strong relationship between or among the people of different religion. There will be better understanding and respect for each other. However, when we let's start with this, we, we define the term interfaith dialogue, what is dialogue, what should be the objectives, and why it is important. So let's see what Quran says, or what is the Quranic approach about interfaith dialogue. In verse 125, chapter 16, Quran says, Invite people to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good counsel, and argue with them in the best of manners. So what are the best of manners that Quran is pointing out? The best of manners one of the best of manners for, for a constructive dialogue or for interfaith di dialogue is that nobody should involve in dialogue with the perception that we are on the right way. Because in the next half of this verse, Quran says only God knows best who is on the right path. There is another verse. 46 of chapter 29 that deal specifically about the dialogue with the people of both or Christian or Jews. This verse says, do not debate with the people of the book unless it is in the best manner. So again, this verse is emphasizing the key component of a constructive dialogue that is use the best manner. And what is the best manner? Willingness to listen and understand other. Do not involve in debate. And the goal should not be, as I said, silence the other side. Another important aspect of the best manner of dialogue is search the strength and value in other's position. The last part of this verse says, and say, we believe in what is sent down to us and sent down to you. And our God and your God is one, and to him we submit. So, so this verse is providing the common ground that will help understanding each other. We understand the importance of interfaith, dialogue. And we understand the objectives of interfaith dialogue. But many people involved in interfaith dialogue with wrong perceptions. And I will just discuss only two wrong perceptions, like based on the misinterpretation of several Quranic verses. Many Muslims and non-Muslims believe that Muslims cannot be friends with the non-Muslims. Another wrong perception, generally, that many Muslims, not all, believe that the salvation is restricted only to a particular group. Involving, in interfaith dialogue, with these wrong perceptions does not help to achieve the objectives of the interfaith dialogue. And keep in mind, the objectives of interfaith dialogues are learning and understanding from each other. We are not trying to convince, we are not trying to silence the other side. So no matter how sincere are the parties involved in the dialogue, but when we have these wrong perceptions and we are engaged in dialogue, we cannot achieve, or we cannot achieve the goal of constructive dialogue. And broken skulls are not an objective. I don't know, it's not one of the objectives, that's right. 
So let's see what Quran says about these perceptions. Let's begin with the salvation of non-Muslims. The Quranic verse 62 of chapter 2 says partly, those who follow the Jewish faith and the Christians and the Sabaeans, all who believe in God and the last day and do righteous deeds shall have their reward with their Lord. So this verse, in my opinion, clearly showing or telling us that the Islam is not an exclusive and not an intolerant religion. Based on this verse, it is clear that salvation is not restricted to any particular religion, to any community, or people of a particular group. This verse ends the religious superiority if any of any group. Another verse, 122 chapter 4, again emphasizes the same concept that the salvation is not restricted to any particular religion. The salvation, there are only two prerequisites. This verse says, those who believe and do good deeds, we shall admit them to the gardens beneath which rivers flow. So there are only two prerequisites being salvaged. Submission to God and moral excellence or good character. So based on these verses, in my opinion and my understanding, the perception that the salvation is restricted to any particular group or religion is not correct. In my opinion, all are welcome to the route that leads to salvation. Now, we discuss the importance of interfaith dialogue. In my opinion, the interfaith dialogue and interfaith friendship are the two sides of the same coin. Because when we involve in interfaith dialogue or interfaith relationship, possibilities emerge that we, the people of different religion, might learn to love and respect each other. Just as Prophet, Prophet Musa commanded, just as Prophet Isa commanded, and just as Prophet Muhammad commanded. But still, but still, there are many Muslims, not all, who believe that Muslims cannot be friends with non-Muslims. So let's see what Quran says about friendship with non-Muslims. This is verse 57 and 58 of chapter 5. All you who believe, do not take those who have taken your faith in jest and fun. So the criteria of the friendship is very general. It is, it is not based on faith. The criteria is we don't take friends who make fun of one's religious belief. This criteria is not applicable only for a particular group or only for people of the book. This criteria is even applicable any Muslim who makes fun of one's religious belief. So, friendship even from a Muslim is not permissible. If the character of that Muslim is not good, if the Muslim making fun of religious belief. So, based on this word, 140 chapter 4, friendship should not be based on the religious beliefs and it should be based on the moral and character. I will skip this slide and let's go 
on this verse 199, chapter 3, we are in fact, Quran encourages Muslims to be friends with non-Muslims. What it says in this verse, surely among the people of the book there are those who believe in Allah and in what has been sent down to you and what has been sent down to them, humbling themselves before Allah. So in this verse, Quran telling us about the good characters of non-Muslims. And remember, the basis of the friendship is the good character, not the affiliation with a particular faith. So the friendship, again, should be based on the moral and character. We understand the importance of interfaith dialogue, the interfaith relationship. But we also, I personally, understand the ground realities too. And the ground realities are the differences between different religions cannot be resolved completely. There will always remain differences. But these differences can be reduced significantly if we turn to Quranic verses such as verses 75 and 113 of chapter 3. Those verses are emphasizing and informing us about the good characters and morals of non-Muslims. Therefore, the Quran requires Muslims to focus on good characters when you are deciding that a particular person should be your friend or not. So finally, based on these verses and based on my personal understanding, I believe that the salvation is not restricted to any particular group or religion. All are welcome, as I said, and Quran encourages its follower to be friend with non-Muslims and people of both. Interfaith dialogue, of course, is necessary for world peace. But when we will involve in interfaith dialogue with the correct perceptions, when we will correct our distorted images about other people, then we can achieve the objectives of interfaith dialogue. And the answer to the question that I asked at the beginning of my presentation, that the Christian Jews and Muslims are afraid or not? So based on these verses and my understanding, the answer is very obvious. Christian Jews and Muslims are friends. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hammond, for a very thought-provoking presentation. We are shifting gears a bit now, as the title of the next presentation indicates, which is called Conceptual Reading of the Quran, Forgetting Identity and Cultivating a Learning Subjectivity for reimagining faith, not interfaith relations. And presenting this will be Faraz Sheikh, who is a PhD candidate at Indiana University in Wilmington in the Department of Religious Studies. His research focuses on the self and self formation in early Muslim thought, as well as in, the, as well as in, in modern times. He is currently writing his dissertation on practices of self formation and the teachings of the 9th century moral pedagogue of Hadith and Hassan. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much. Uh, can anyone hear me in the back? No. Can you hear me now? I'm not sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I, um, I hate to be uh, you know, the one that's going to spoil all the fun. First presentation was very nice, um, so I would like you to not think of my presentation really uh, in juxtaposition to the previous one. Uh, it's more of a experimental study, uh, meditation on uh, a certain question of hermeneutics and problems, problematizings, uh, self understandings. Uh, so let me begin. Um, Interfaith relations involving Muslims and initiatives to foster such relations uh, have become a prominent feature of the American religious landscape over the last few years, uh, for understandable reasons that I need not recount. 
But for many Muslims, the Quran is an enigmatic text when it comes to narratives about Jews and Christians. Uh, to uh, put it briefly, uh, the multi-community world announced in verses like 548, where God is understood to be revealing the reason for creating many communities so that they may compete with each other in, in good works and good deeds, um, and verses such as we saw in Bakara, where uh, the, late, you know, the categories of Jews and Christians are mentioned among others as believers who are will have the reward of God. Uh, but these verses, uh, to my mind, sit rather uneasily with a host of other verses in the Quran uh, that are quite categorical in condemning and censuring certain uh, categories of people, uh, namely uh, Jews and Christians among them. Uh, and I think uh, the ambiguity of the Quran on the question of Jews and Christians and other groups uh, is it's, it's rather so obvious to me that I didn't really plan to argue to demonstrate that ambiguity, but I'm sure most of you can recall verses and uh, so I can spare me the, the work. Uh, and of course, uh, the whole historical uh, enterprise of the Nasr and Mansuk and abrogation attempts to address that very those sorts of issues. Uh, and because those things and the historical tradition deals with those issues in a, you know, or attempts to do so in a comprehensive way and compelling way, uh, there is an understanding, I think, among contemporary scholars of the Quran that the only really nuanced reading of the Quran is one that is historic, historical and uh, not universal. And that several scholars have argued, uh, you know, stuff to my way of Mr. Rahman and then so, you know, following one word that a historical and universalist readings that are also called naive or innocent lead to a very rigid and fundamentalist reading of scripture. And what uh, what I want to do uh, is that I want to create a little experiment here for you of this naive universalist reader. Uh, and I want to, uh, I'm doing this in the third person, of course this universalist naive reader is me in very, very important ways, but I want to sort of externalize this person so that I can uh, criticize his, or I'm going to use the his, but I have with, with no, you know, uh, disrespect of the, uh, the women even. No, I just well, I don't have time to say his and her. So, um, so this reader, this universalist reader, I want to illustrate this universalist reader's approach to certain texts in the Quran and how this reader might, a modern universalist reader, might read these. And again, it's a might. You don't have to, they may do otherwise. But I want to make the argument in the end that these universalist ahistorical readings can actually be uh, open a different kind of avenue for thinking about things like what we call interfaith relations. Uh, I, I'm going to stop short of arguing that everyone should give up their identity. But what I do want to suggest is that insofar as one approaches the text, insofar as one approaches the Quran in modern age, uh, specifically a Muslim here I'm talking about, who's self-identifying as a Muslim, uh, would or could benefit in a, in a way that I would try to illustrate my imaginary reader benefits uh, by suspending that self-identity, or at least destabilizing it to a certain extent. So let me then proceed um, to this self-identifying, naive, universalist Muslim. I'm just going to not call him that anymore, just the reader. Uh, so what, what are the assumptions 
that this universalist reader might have of the text. So some obvious ones suggest to me is that this, is, this person would insist that his maker is speaking in the text to him, uh, and that so his speech should be relevant to him, that nothing in the text should really not make sense, and that's all right, that if something doesn't make sense, that there would be a uh, desire to make sense of the text and make it relevant. Uh, and also, perhaps, um, a willingness to learn about who, how he should understand himself. Uh, so let's start then with a few illustrations. Uh, I don't have much time, so I'll be very, very quick. But you already get the gist of my argument, I suppose. So for example, the Universalist reads the Quranic verse, uh, chapter 39, verse 22. It says, uh, and actually I'm going to have a three-step argument here. For one, I'm going to talk about how the Universalist might read references to Islam or Muslim in the Quran. Uh, and then next, I'm going to talk about how this person, uh, I, I think I'll mention when I get there. So here's a verse that has the word Islam in it. So it says, Afaman shah Allahu sadruhu il-islami fahuwa ala nurin min rabbi. Right? Now, what could this universalist reader make of this verse? And I suggest that he could read this verse as Islam as mentioned as a light from God. And as this verse may lead him to contemplate what it is about submitting to his maker that lets him experience a light and being on the light so that he may uh, try to understand the very act of submission in that context, in that way. Uh, he, he may look to his heart to attempt to see whether his heart has indeed been opened by God to such submission. Um, and then he might find that the verse continues and says, And may decide that this verse actually opens up to him or is explaining to him what submission means. It means it has something to do with remembering God. And the opposite of submission is hardening of the heart, which is the forgetting of remembrance of God, whatever that means. That, you know, another line of contemplation might be open for this person. It says, what, what do I understand from remembering God? Uh, now, such a reading, I argue, is entirely based on universalist and ahistoric assumptions about this verse, and there's no reference to when this verse was revealed, and to whom was it revealed, and who are the people who are, who are, whose hearts are open, and who have, uh, and of course, the reading of Islam as not a religion that God is inviting people to enter into, but rather an attitude towards creation or the Creator. Um, let me share the other verse, the verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 85. I'm using my pages. And that's what it says, if one goes in search of a religion other than Islam, self-surrender, unto God, it will never be accepted from him. And in the life to come, he shall be among the lost. Among the lost. Another verse, Chapter 5, verse 3 says, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يَقْبُلَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ فِي آخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Now this translation, uh, I mean, roughly today I perfected your religion for you and have bestowed upon you the full measure of my blessings and will that self-surrender for Islam, so what is which one one chooses, unto me shall be your religion. The universalist looks at this verse and ignoring its historical context, tries to understand what the deen of Islam might mean here. He can argue using his universalist interpretation that Islam is being talked about as an attitude of creation. 
that is acceptable to God. That is an attitude that the creation displays. Uh, so for example, this universalist reader could argue that as a creation of God, water rejects that it possesses any knowledge, wisdom, or compassion to quench the drinker's thirst. That it is this unacceptability of demonstrated by water as God's creature, creature, which is what the Quran is telling about God's unacceptability of anything but submission to him. Let me move on to what such universalist assumptions do uh, to this reader. The reader, the such a reader would read the verses in the Quran that talk about the gap between word and experience. It talks about, for example, the verse uh, Bin Bakr to uh, where verse 8 says, and so among the people are, uh, who say we believe in God or uh, Allah in the last day, but they do not really believe. Now, such a person uh, so such a person reads this verse not talking about Medellin hypocrites or referring to some historical community, but attempts to, and, and as a result, it destabilizes his identity as a, or a self-claimed identity that is one of a believer or a Muslim, as this verse must also apply or can also apply to him. 29, chapter 29, verse 2. Do men think that they will be left alone on saying we believe and that they will not be tested? Again, the difference, the gap between saying I believe and believing becomes visible and uh, open for such a reader. And the reader would, to my mind, would could try to resolve this, to, this gap that is opened up and would therefore embark on a, a journey of contemplation or understanding. And similarly, chapter 12, 106, that most of them believe not in Allah without associating partners with him. Again, the idea that believing in God actually is a stepping stone to associating partners with him. And that the process of not associating partners with him is not a verbal declaration, but rather a process of interpretation of existence. So this universalist reader is what I am calling would inhabit or find it compelling to inhabit a learning subjectivity regardless of whatever self-identity they, they might have used to approach the text. Finally, coming to the question of interfaith, this, and this is, although I'm not quoting the sources, but this is not really me, uh, uh, who's, who's the first one to say this, uh, I have a passage here, or I did have a passage from Rumi, uh, who talks about, well, here he is, and I was quickly say, Rumi says, Moses, and I'm just cutting it right to the, the sentence that I need, Moses and Pharaoh are in your being. You must seek these two adversaries in yourself. And this is not, you know, perhaps somebody else before Rumi also said this, and the point is, uh, I don't say here because I don't want this universalist reader to be suddenly associated only with a Sufi Islam or belonging to a particular tradition. This could be just anyone trying to make sense of the text for themselves in the modern world. Uh, and so the point then therefore is that if Pharaoh and Moses are in me, where are Jews and Christians? And so this universalist reader can very well, within his assumptions, conclude that the mentions of Jews and Christians in the Quranic text is God addressing aspects of their own being. That these categories are in fact types of attitudes that the person may now or in the future inhabit with or without their knowledge and against which they would have to struggle to uh, keep alive their consciousness or to keep learning. 
Um, and I have examples of such verses. Uh, one of them is quite relevant, where Jews and Christians are made to say, you know, that they say, be part of our Mila, and you say the guidance is from God. And that's, the universalist reader reads that, can read that to mean the self-identification of within a group is precisely the kind of attitude that the Quranic verse is condemning. So that if I just assume I'm a member of such and such community, that is that invitation to be Milla, that temptation to be just part of a Milla, versus saying that no guidance must be from God and that guidance will reach me as knowledge as the verse continues to talk about, that it must, must become my knowledge so that I, can, I should be able to understand it. And so those references to Jews and Christians would, would be, by a universalist reader, a historical, naive reader, actually uh, create a kind of subjectivity that would uh, be quite, would not be rigid and not be fundamentalist, it's possible. And uh, in fact, so in that sense, I would say that to stabilize in conclusion, uh, to stabilize identities very strongly uh, leads to a kind of a bind for readers of the Quran where certain correct verses must be referenced and some, uh, some other verses are really should be sort of ignored. Or whereas a universalist reader, to whatever extent he or she is successful, can at least hermeneutically be uh, consistent and say, I'm going to try and make sense of these categories as conceptual categories that have to be with me. And that, in this case, discussions about interfaith dialogue can be called that, but more appropriately, it could be discussions, you know, so interfaith discussions could be discussions about faith, uh, or discussions in faith and for faith. Uh, and this, I think, destabilization is important, at least in my thought experiment that I am going through, so uh, no strong pronouncements to me. Thank you very much. Thank you for all for providing this very different, I think, work bottom line that I wish to read for them. Uh, up next, we have Catherine Bronson, who is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Deloitte College focuses on early Islamic intellectual thought and Quranic exegesis. And her paper today is Adam Sal, the Quranic Thief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as I open my PowerPoint, I would just like to thank the organizers of this conference for bringing us here together. Um, I'm very excited to be here, especially with all of the new sort of developments in Quranic studies. And if you'll pardon me, I'm going to open my email in front of everybody. But the only, there's nothing private in it. Um, if I could type. Today, um, essentially, to situate my discussion a bit before beginning, um, I think this is an important panel. Mine takes a slightly different focus in that I'm sort of looking at, um, I'm sort of in dialogue with some of the earlier, um, I 
guess we could say polemics or rhetoric, um, in which the Quran, especially, particularly about 100 years ago or so, um, there was a lot of discourse that went on in sort of lively the Quran as, you know, discursive, disjointed, um, various um, sort of passages um, that were lifted or co-opted, reappropriated, reconstituted, all of these words um, were used in this sort of thing. And so when I began this, uh, this is a work in progress, by the way, it's part of my dissertation, um, which I just completed actually a year ago. Um, and so what this chapter or this project does, it sort of looks at the Quranic verses um, on Eve, so Adam's wife, in context. Okay, so what I've done is I've sort of read them in tandem with one another, um, taking the methodology of many of the people who are working in the field right now, because it's certainly not my um, sort of idea to do this, and sort of looked at these three sort of textual units where Eve, Adam, Zawj, appears in the Quran. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit, and then I will move to my PowerPoint. Um, I have a couple of things that I want to do today. I want to sort of situate the problematic, introduce you to these verses. It's a, little, it's a big job to be done in this small amount of time, I'm aware. And then perhaps uh, talk about some of the exegesis on Eve. Okay, so the post-Quranic tradition and how that also draws on the sacred well of, you know, motifs and tropes that have been reiterated through history. And I think that the early Muslim confessing um, or the, the exegetes came up with as well. Um, so the primary focus of this project is a form of critical analysis of the literary and situational structures of the Eve narratives in the Quran. References to the primal female are found in three separate revelatory units. Taha, which is early Meccan in its revelation. Okay, so put that up. Um, I wish that I would have brought in the English <coughs> handout, but if you have your Quran with you or your translation, it's Taha 117 through 123. Um, Al-A'ra, okay, and there you go with that. Um, and finally, Al-Baqarah, okay, which is Medinan. So the first two are early Meccan. Um, well, actually, early Meccan, late Meccan, and Al-Baqarah. And I'm using Naldaki's schema for this, by the way. Um, the three narrative blocks are truly metatextual in the sense that they consist of parallel layers of successive sections that refer, comment upon, comment on, and presuppose one another. In other words, it is not merely the impact of a singular textual unit that is important, but also the net cumulative effect of the three texts in tandem with each other and our presumed audience. Okay, and this is where, again, I think we have to step away for a moment and say that the Quran, as has been discussed earlier, assumes audience familiarity with a lot of these sort of textual blocks in the text. One of the recurring sort of implications, or one of the recurring, not implications, one of the recurring um, things in the Quran that comes up over and over again is it says wa'i, and that can be translated as remember when, and then a story unfolds, okay? But that story might necessarily, it's not linear. It wouldn't be sort of historical, um, sort of plot by plot point. Instead, what I argue in here, to, to move away from the reading a bit, what I argue in here is that essentially these, um, I guess, tidbits or pericopes about Adam so she's never mentioned by name, um, what we find is they sort of relate to the overall schema of the surah in which they appear, or the, the chapter in which they appear. Okay? And so they have contextual weight within the, within the chapters they appear in. Um, such textual disbursement, and this is what I talked about in the beginning, sort of addressing some of the accusations, or I, I don't know, accusations is probably not the best word, but some of the discourse that has been written about the Quran, uh, that, you know, basically this whole idea that the, you have this discursivity in the Quran um, is actually something that the medieval exegetes had a word for, and that was called tasrif, or variegation. Okay, um, and this is a mode of narrative that is featured heavily in the Quran, and, it be, and it's most clearly observed in instances where stories are told, okay? And so we do know that there are some longer passages that contain uh, an entire story, but the Eve narratives, for instance, do not function that way. We can talk more about what's said in each of these. Um, I will, just in the interest of time, scroll down and I'll, I'll basically tell you what is in the Eve narratives and what is not. Um, and so essentially what they all say, or if we can take them as sort of, um, as sort of a grouping, 
Um, basically, there's, there's an absence of a linear account of women. The first three clusters uh, highlight different aspects of the metacosmology, if we can call it that. Um, a, a composite statue of the Assault. God lodges Adam and Eve um, in the garden and provides for them abundantly. So this is stated over and over. Um, if we do this, I think this highlights uh, sort of where the similarities are. Um, the devil, alternatively known as Iblis and Shaitan, okay, and it, it, it sort of makes a difference um, whether the devil is called Shaitan or Iblis. It's in context, actually, to um, with whom the devil is speaking and at what moment in the narratives. Uh, he arrives on the scene and whispers, okay, and he convinces Adam and Eve to eat out of the tree um, in order that they might obtain, uh, obtain eternal life and immortal status um, or domination over the earth. Um, they obey, and Satan su successfully causes them to slip. Okay, so the word that is used for that is a zalahuma. So the only way that we understand that this is all happening, that, you know, this pronoun dices, this, this idea that the grammatical dual, muthenna, is being used in the Quran again and again. Um, at that point, they lose their heavenly garments, and after their transgression, they become aware of their sexuality. Uh, when they realize that their private parts are exposed, they stitch together leaves from the garden to expose their genitalia, and then God demotes them to earth. Um, so although each of these accounts sort of warrant separate investigation um, in terms of what they're doing, we can say that they all sort of, in a combined way, tell this narrative. Uh, one of the, the things that I borrowed, one of the words that I borrowed from um, Angelica Neuberg, who has done extensive work reading things vertically or together, the way that I'm trying to do with these e-verses, is to suppose that something can be called a hypotext, okay? Especially in places where characters, sacred personas, prophets, um, what have you are mentioned, or women in this case. Um, and you would find a hypotext meaning that it sort of contains all the fundamental elements of the story. Um, and then that story, I argue, the, this is my whole argument here, is later developed in the later revelations, especially if we take the whole schemata, the, you know, the Meccan, Medina um, schemata to be, to be sound. Okay, so Baha sort of has all of the major implications in it, okay? Um, what is later developed in Araf and Bakara, um, you, get, you get more sort of focus in the story. For example, in Araf, there's more of a focus, I'm sorry, in Bakara, there's more of a focus on the devil's role, okay, on, on Shaitan's role, or sometimes he's known as Iblis. Um, some of the similarities between the three narratives are that, you know, they always sort of, they start with the declamatory voice, but the voice is, of course, always mantic. So there was a discussion earlier about um, how the Quran speaks to us. Um, so it, it always starts off with sort of the, the overarching voice, sort of the declamatory voice in the background. And then there is some personal dialogue within all of these. And they all go out on similar notes as well, even some of the exact languages used, especially when um, the, the, the primal pair is cast down to earth. One of the things that I would like to mention, though, is uh, Surah al-Baqarah sort of ends on, and again, if we want to compare these, if we want to talk about um, comparative, uh, comparing Christianity, Christian narratives with um, Islam, and I don't proclaim to be an expert um, by any means in anything to do uh, with Christianity. I did look into this humbly for my dissertation. However, I would, you know, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected. Um, as I understand, the, uh, the, what happens in Genesis leads to original sin and these sort of things, or, you know, it leads to condemnation of the first couple. Um, in the Quran, however, when the primal pair is cast out, if we take Surah Al-Baqarah to be the last revelation in Medina, it actually says, go down from here, for now you will have guidance, and, and you will not lose hope, okay? So it ends on a very different note. In other words, as I sort of argued at the end, um, it provides sort of hope for human beings that not all is lost and there is no despair to be had. That this is just sort of a reconstitution in, um, in what the earth or what your destiny or fate is going to be like. Um, so you have these, and uh, if we have some time, I'd just like to get, yes, oh, sorry. Uh, I'd just like to get into the exegesis. So, uh, as you might have noted, again, one of my interests in this was having grown up in the uh, Catholic tradition, 
and then having converted to Islam, one of the first things that I was told was, one of the first, one of the major things that I was told was, you know, Eve is not condemned in the Quran. She's, you know, she's not held culpable of any sins. Um, she doesn't, you know, function as uh, the temptress. All of this is sort of absent. However, I would argue how, that Eve's role in the Quran is not something that we can say is, um, perhaps we can say that she is Adam's shadow self. She's not individuated. She doesn't function in any way on her own. So I don't know if this is an exoneration or not. She's there. She's in the background. She's, you know, she comes through um, basically pronouns. She's introduced. But she doesn't, of course, she doesn't play a major role in tempting Adam or anything like that. But what can we say about her not being mentioned? You know, the fact that she has, does she have any agency? We hear these words now today. They're very important, agency, especially in gender feminine studies. So she has no agency. So is this good or bad? That's one of the questions I leave out for you. In the exegesis, however, getting into the last, um, you know, we can talk more about the exegesis, but by the earliest exegist, by Mokhata bin Suleiman, who dies in 150, we already have some of the, you know, some of the discourse that, uh, you know, we can talk about the borrowing thesis, all of this sort of discourse that uh, seems to share in this sacred sort of well of, you know, uh, Christian thought, Jewish thought, and then Islamic thought. And that is the motifs that are absent in the Quran. For example, the rib, the serpent. Uh, you know, Eve is created from a rib. The serpent comes on the scene and she's, the serpent is a she in all of the uh, exegesis that I've looked at. Um, that they come together um, and they, you know, sort of disobey together. This stuff all surfaces right away in the early Islamic tradition. And so you get all of this, you know, Eve is corrupt. Eve makes you know, her husband drunk, she tells him she will withhold sex if he does not eat from the tree. She's made from a crooked rib, and therefore women are disobedient to their husbands. So you get all this discourse. Um, and, you know, and I would just like to end with, when I talk about this discourse, I don't think there was any malicious intent going on. I think a lot of these early exegetes um, were hussas, so they were storytellers, and they relied on sort of the tales that were ambient, to use, you know, a generic word, they were sort of around, um, to fill in the gaps, to fill in the lacuna. But we do indeed have then um, a great parallelism in, you know, when we look at sort of midrash, when we look at Islamic exegesis, when we look at sort of any of the explanatory works, you get a great sort of overlap. Though I would argue that the Quranic narrative on Eve is, is quite distinct, okay? So those are some of my uh, initial thoughts. So my presentation is entitled Abridging the Israeliat. And this Israeliat is a term used of, uh, of early traditions, Jewish and Christian uh, traditions that were incorporated into Islamic exegesis by converts to Islam. And how these, these Israeliat, these, these Jewish and Christian traditions, are removed in Sheikh Ahmed Shakaf's summary of Tafsir.
Ecclesia or the Epicathia, or the Chronic Commentary of the Epicathia. And this is uh, of the book of, of Ahmed Shaka called Umda the Tafsir, and it's one of the abridgment cells for other abridgments of the Epicathia uh, in the modern period. <clears throat> so to a key point in Muslim, Christian, and Jewish dialogue is the relationship of religion and scriptures to one another. In terms of Islam, scholars have long noted that many of the Quranic stories have biblical precedents. The majority of the Quranic prophets, prophets are found within the Bible, and many of the narratives are similar. Thus, from an early time, Muslim scholars asked whether they could use Jewish and Christian sources to better understand the Quran. In particular, they debated the position of the Zarayat, or biblical literature incorporated into, Mus into the Muslim exegetical tradition through converts to Islam. As the Islamic message spread, some Jewish and Christian scholars converted to Islam and naturally interpreted the Qur'an through their intellectual heritage. Muslim scholars debated what way to give these traditions and interpret the Qur'an through the biblical tradition. Scholars have faulted the medieval exegesis of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Kathir, and both Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Kathir are seen as the founder of modern Islamic movements, <coughs> even though they lived in Scholars have faulted the medieval exegesis of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Kathir for the gradual removal of the Zoraniyat from Quranic exegesis. In this paper, I will argue that even though Ibn Kathir was critical of the Zoraniyat, it's only in the modern period that biblical material is excised from the Quran, from Quranic commentary. Ibn Kathir, in fact, relies on an Arabic translation of the Bible throughout his throughout composing his commentary of the Quran, and often incorporates biblical narratives within his exegesis. However, it is the modern reformist scholars of Muhammad Abdul, Rashid Rilla, and Ahmed Shaka, the author of this, of this uh, tafsir, that the Israeliyat are eventually removed from Quranic exegesis. In his summary of tafsir of Ibn Kathir, Ahmed Shaka made the strategic decision to omit the Israeliyat believing that the Qur'an supersedes previous revelations. Scholars such as Robert Totally have observed that modern Qur'anic exegesis has significantly reduced the presence of the Israelite. As he states, in modern Qur'anic commentaries, the traditions which have been reported for centuries have disappeared, leaving space for a different type of evaluation. While the Israelite were included in the classical tafsirs of Al-Qabri and Al-Da'anabi, they are conspicuously absent within modern history. Totally <coughs> traces this development to the Islamic reformers of Muhammad Abdu and his student Rashid Ridla. Muhammad Abdu and Rashid Ridla drew on Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Kathir to develop suspicious and at times hostile attitude toward sources that had Jewish and Christian origins. Rod Ronald Nettler adds that Abdu and Ridla saw much of this Israeli act as being irrational and contradicting human reason. In an attempt to create a modern, rational Islam, Abdul and Ridha advocated for the removal of the Zoraniyat from Quranic commentary. In this paper, I will demonstrate that Ahmed Shagrat continued the themes of Abdul and Ridha by bridging the Zoraniyat from his summary of Tafsir and Kathir. And this is a picture of Sheikh Ahmed Shagrat. As you can see through his dates of his life, he grew up in a time of transition, in the late 19th century, living all the way through the mid 20th century. He was a Azari Sheikh, uh, which witnessed Br British occupation and advocated for the, pr the prevalence of the Sharia in Egyptian society. Ahmed Shakir and the Zoraniyat. Shakir devotes a special section to the Zoraniyat in his chapter on the methodology of his abridgment. Shakir explains that while Ibn Kathir criticizes the Zoraniyat severely within his tafsir, he nonetheless includes them within his commentary. This is an astute observation, since many scholars have highlighted how Ibn Kathir is critical of the Israeli act, not realizing that he also weaves them into his exegetical narrative. Shakir proceeds to quote Ibn Kathir's methodology in engaging the Israeli act, which are derived from Ibn Taymiyyah's introduction to the methodology of Quranic exegesis, or his famous book, Muqaddimah fi Asul al Tafsir. <clears throat> Ibn Kathir states that Israeli act can be quoted as supplementary evidence, istishhad, but not as evidence in themselves, if implied. For Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Kathir, 
there are three types of Israeli yet. That which Muslims know to be true through corroborating them with Islamic sources, that which Muslims know to be false, and that which is neither and thus judgment should, should be suspended on them. Shaka then comments that as one thing to relay from the people of the book, Jews and Christians, narration that the Muslim community is unsure of, but it's another to mention them within the explanation of the Quran itself. For Shakir, it is unacceptable, unacceptable to use doubtful narrations, such as Zoraria, to elucidate the words of God. Shakir explained that the Prophet ordered the Muslim community to neither accept nor reject the Zoraria. This is from a famous hadith, <coughs> But by using Zoraria to comment uh, and explain the Quran, the chronic exegetes were in fact accepting authenticity of the biblical material against the Prophet's command. Shakra then begins a list of quotations from Tafsir which are critical of his Zoraliyah. For instance, in his discussion regarding the different aims of Satan, Shakra cites Ibn Qadir's explanation that many of the traditions are taken from the Zoraliyah, which often conflict with the Islamic message. The Quran is sufficient, Ibn Qadir continues, and there is no need to rely on previous traditions. This is already at are full of distortions, and additions, and omissions, and many of them are clearly fabricated. Ibn Qadir then makes a point to contrast the Islamic scholarly tradition with that of the people of the book, Jews and Christians, explaining that they do not have righteous scholars of prophetic reports, hadith, who are able to sift through the various narrations. Ibn Qadir concludes by praising Muslim hadith scholars who compiled and edited the books of Hadith and were able to sort out the good and authentic traditions from the weak and fabricated. As a Hadith scholar himself, Ibn Kathir employs the methodology of Hadith science and is skeptical of biblical material because they contain no chains of transmission and their con contents are often incompatible with the Islamic message. Shakir, however, does not cite any part of the Syria of Ibn Kathir where he relies on biblical Ibn Kathir, for example, references Genesis 16 and 17 in his argument that Ishmael was the firstborn son of Abraham and must have been the intended sacrifice, not Isaac. Ibn Kathir notes that in the Bible it states that Abraham was 86 when Ishmael was born and 99 at Isaac's birth. There is no doubt that Ishmael was the oldest and only son until Isaac was born. As Ibn Kathir quotes Genesis 22, states that Abraham should slaughter his only son, making obvious that the intended sacrifice was issued. Shakir makes no reference, reference to this exegetical point or other places where Ibn Kathir references biblical narratives. Shakir concludes this section on the Zoraliyat with the tradition of Ibn Abbas that exemplifies his attitude towards the literature. Ibn Abbas says, O oh Muslims, why do you ask the people of the book on things? When your book, the Quran, is the one God revealed to his prophet Muhammad, and is the most recent of revelations, God has informed you that the people of the book distorted their script and changed it, and wrote it with their own hands. Then they said, it is from God, in order to make a small gain. Did not God prevent you in what was revealed to you, i.e. the Quran, regarding their affairs? By God, I have not seen anyone among the people of the book ask you concerning what was revealed to you. Shakir praises this narration, noting that an admirable, powerful admonition, and is mentioned in the authoritative hadith collection of the Bukhari three times. For Shakir, this tradition represents the ideal Muslim view towards the Zoraliyah. The tradition condemns Muslims from asking Jews and Christians regarding their scripture. Since God's most recent revelation, the Quran, supersedes previous scripture. As God says in the Quran, the people of the book distorted the scriptures, even writing portions of them, and then claiming it originated from God. Additionally, why should Muslims ask the people of the book regarding their scripture when they are not asking Muslims concerning theirs? Jews and Christians do not see Muslim scriptures as authoritative. So why should Muslims see the Bible as so? Thus, in contrast to Ibn Kathir, Shakir advocates for a complete avoidance is Even though he admits that the Prophet allowed for the transmission of the literature, Shakir did not believe that it had a place in Quranic commentary. 
the word of God should not be explained by unreliable traditions that often conflict with the Islamic message. To conclude, even though Shakir did not finish his summary, his work spurred other abridgments and influenced the composition of future Quranic commentaries. The abridgments of Sabuni, this is uh, Sabuni's 1973 abridgment of Tafsir ibn Kathir. So Shakir himself never, he only finished five volumes and he had passed away in 1958. But the great Quran scholar of Sabuni would actually finish the task and complete an abridgment of Tafsir ibn Kathir in one volume. <coughs> And Darasanan continued Shakir's theme of removing Ibn Kathir's discussion regarding the Zulariyat. So this is a very famous edition of, of Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Uh, the Darasanan was published originally in Saudi Arabia, but was translated to English and has a very strong following in, in the West, in America. And as you can see here, it says abridged. Right? You can see that? So it says Tafsir Ibn Kathir, but right underneath it's abridged. And these Bridgments of Slavuni and of Darasanam continue Shakir's theme of really removing Jewish and Christian sources from Tafsir ibn Kathir and Quran commentary in general. <laughs> Sayyid Qutb Shehrawi would additionally build off Shakir and compose new commentaries that exclude Israeli altogether. So, this is once again another famous Quran commentary that's translated into English. Sayyid Qutb in the shade of the Quran. And if you read this carefully, it also does not make any reference to Jewish and Christian sources or any biblical narrative. Similar to Shaka, Qutb and Shalarawi's commentaries were directed towards a wider, non-specialist audience and thus chose to focus on what they viewed as the essential message of the Qur'an. They did not want to embark on a critical evaluation of the Zulriya, but rather present Islam as a viable alternative to post-colonial ideologies of capitalism, socialism, and communism. In the process, modern tafsir largely omits the Israeliyat compared to its pre-modern counterparts. Thank you very much. Ways, uh, whether from the side of the biblical tradition, which has 
tried to uh, push the Quran away or from the side of the, the Islamic tradition which has tried to perhaps isolate the Quran in the way uh, Yunus uh, was describing, isolate the Quran from its, its biblical surroundings. Uh, one way or another, we've been more nervous about the relationship of the two than the Quran itself has been. If I can begin with the, the first two papers, which really, uh, interestingly, come together in, in this question of uh, Muslims and Christians and Jews relating to one another. Uh, that's an area of my, my experience. Uh, I don't like to claim expertise, but uh, experience at least. I think the, the issue that, that came up for me in, in these two papers is the uh, the ambiguity of historicizing. Uh, I, I understood uh, Faraz's position that there is a certain danger to the historicized reading, which, uh, which the universalist reading can often uh, get around. But I think it was also uh, clear from Professor Hamid's paper that uh, historicized readings also give possibilities because you can leave uh, statements of difference back there in history. You can say that this uh, particularly negative portrayal, for example, of some Christians or some Jews is precisely just about some Christians, some Jews, those back there in that particular history, which then opens the way for a more universalist reading. So I think uh, historicizing the text uh, offers possibilities. It also offers dangers because one can say also of the, the positive uh, Quranic evaluations of Christians and Jews, well, that was just about them. Uh, for example, the, the, uh, the verses you gave us about the people who believe uh, in God on the last day and who, uh, who do good works. Well, many Muslims, of course, would read that as being about just those historians, ones who came before the arrival of Islam. And so uh, I think that there is a, a way to get uh, historicism and universalism to, to somehow work together. But really the question comes down uh, and it becomes clear listening to these uh, both very generous spirited readings. It comes down to the question of uh, what I usually call the ethics of reading the Quran. And to talk about the ethics of reading the Bible also. We, we approach this uh, from the situation in which we have already made an ethical decision for the other. We have made an ethical decision and we take responsibility for that decision uh, for tolerance, for generosity, for uh, peace, rather than uh, throwing up our hands and saying, well, I don't have any ethical say in this because the text just says that. Well, texts don't just say anything. Texts speak to people. And the place of meaning is in the space between the text and the reader. Uh, and the reader has, uh, in every age, but perhaps in our own age, uh, when the stakes are so high, more than in some other ages, uh, the reader has an ethical responsibility <coughs> to choose the reading and to take responsibility for the reading which she does. Just if she there, just to balance it. <laughs> so th thank you for those two. Uh, I, I, I would love to, we can, we can talk more about them uh, as we go on with the time, time is running. I don't want to take your time. Uh, Dr. Branson's paper, uh, which I had the opportunity to read in full, uh, or I, I had the opportunity to read the chapter in full uh, last night, so uh, I've heard more than you have. Uh, I, I was interested in your approach. You, you have these three texts, uh, and you choose uh, the first of them from Taha as the hypotext, uh, and the other two as hypertexts. So the, the undertext and two overtexts. Uh, Dr. Branson talks about stacking of the, the verticality of, the, uh, of these texts. And I, uh, I wonder about that, just looking at the texts, uh, Myself, uh, you, you want to accept uh, the arguments for, for Nurlega's 
chronology, and uh, I'm not certain that I'm, I'm as uh, optimistic about that, although you accuse people who are against uh, that chronological argument as being strident. But, uh, I don't think I'd be strident, but I have my questions. Uh, one could say, though, uh, that none of these three texts, perhaps, is, is the hypo text, the, because hypo, of course, is Greek for sub. So none of these texts is the subtext, but if one borrows uh, the term that uh, Gabriel Reynolds used in his recent book, it's the biblical text which is actually the, the hypo text, the subtext. Uh, and these are, as you say, these are not simply repetitions of the biblical story, these are particular takes on the biblical story. But there is no attempt, I think, to, to hide the connection. And I, I, I'm not sure that uh, choosing the Taha uh, uh, excerpt really answers, the, puts all the cards on the table, whether one could just take the, the Taha uh, excerpt and read that as though it gives us all the information we want. Clearly, the Quran is addressing people who know more than what is said. <coughs> So uh, rather than taking these three texts uh, as though somehow they, they offer us uh, a completeness, um, I think the hypotext really has to be the, the biblical and post-biblical tradition. Uh, you, you speak uh, <coughs> about the, the getting down, which, which uh, God sending uh, Iblis down, God sending Adam and Eve down to earth. And, and you say that it's not a punishment. I have a difficulty with that because Iblis is sent down uh, in, in uh, chapter 7. Of course, it's Iblis, and, and there's, it's not that Iblis is uh, going down there to have a nice time to be done. Uh, it, it seems to me very clear that, that the get, get down on all, all of you uh, has the ring of punishment from it. You say in your paper that, uh, that uh, in the biblical tradition, Adam and Eve are, are sent to earth as a punishment, but Adam and Eve were created on earth in the biblical tradition. They're not created in heaven and sent to earth. Uh, one might, might also think of, uh, in the biblical tradition, of course, there are two trees in the garden. You, you comment on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but uh, the Quran seems to uh, hit upon principally the tree of immortality, the tree of life, as it's called in the Genesis tradition. But you also have that notion that uh, Iblis says to them, the only reason God doesn't want you to, uh, to eat of that tree is because you will become angels or immortal. So you've actually got the two, the two things are, are both there in the Quran uh, text. So I, I think a closer look at the, at the, uh, the Genesis text uh, might offer you, offer you some more insights into the Quran text. I'm not sure, I think, just to be a bit feminist for the moment, I'm not, I'm not sure that Eve really doesn't have any agency here. Uh, I think the use of the dual uh, in the eating, for example, I mean, she, it's not an independent agency, but uh, neither she nor Adam is singled out as having eaten. They, they, the two of them ate. And so she is as much an agent there as he is, though perhaps uh, less, less an agent than a biblical text. Uh, you, you talk about, uh, I, I come back to this, you talk about reading the, the Quran through the biblical text, but I, I just wonder whether some other prepositions are not helped, helpful to us with, alongside or with the biblical tradition. Uh, because it, it's not, it, I, I think there, there, is a nest, there is definitely a problem about reading the Quran through the biblical tradition, uh, because that that gives us perhaps a distorted view of what the Quran itself says. We, we go looking for something. Uh, but to, to read them alongside one another, to read them in conversation with one another, uh, to read them interestingly in Jadal with one another, so it brings us uh, to our, our paper this morning about Jadal and dialectic. And the, the verses that you quoted, which actually say debate with, debate with people, Jadal. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure again whether, I'm, whether the idea of a dialogue that, uh, that is not really some, in some sense a struggle. Uh, I'm not sure how far I go with you on that. I, I, 
I don't mind. You know, I've been many years involved in interfaith dialogue. Or, uh, I like the idea for us of, of saying this is faith dialogue, uh, precisely because I expect my faith to be challenged. By it. I, I'm perfectly happy to have a, a dialogue. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to, for Muslims to say to me, and I think it's it's essential for Christian theology for, uh, for Christians to hear Muslims say. We think you people are tritheists. Uh, it's, it's, it's important to know what Christian language suggests to people and to hear that critique and to, and to consider it carefully and, and to ask oneself, uh, why do I say what I say? How can I say better what I say, etc. Not that I think we will come to uh, agreement, but our, our disagreements may be more fruitful. So I, I think that happens when we, we read the texts together. I was interested in, you pointed out that it's, it's precisely in the modern period that, uh, that this pushing aside of the, of the biblical material, the biblical and post-biblical material happens. And I wonder uh, whether you think it might be a kind of reflex of, of the polemical and, and this move in the 19th century from, principally from biblical scholars initially, to look at the Quran and say, ah, this is, this is being taken. So, uh, whether, whether what is happening in the modern period is precisely because of the attempts by, by Christian and Jewish writers to kind of repossess the Quran and say this is really, it's really a Jewish text if only you knew, or it's really a Christian text. And, and you know, we see this with Luxembourg and with Luling uh, and people like that, trying to say the Quran is not really a Muslim text. It's just, it's just a poorly understood Christian text. I think that, uh, that and it begins in the 19th century or perhaps even a little earlier, uh, that is probably what elicits a response which says we have to make the Quran somehow self-contained. And the Quran has to be able to stand on its own terms. And as long as we, we are referring to the Israeli ad and, and other uh, materials for an understanding of it and recognizing its relationship with that, then it is vulnerable. The Quran is, seems to me doesn't have that anxiety. Yeah. Uh, it's not worried about being understood in the history of it. Yeah. Uh, but but our traditions and, and this happens, of course, it happened with uh, in, in early Christianity with, with Marcy, you know, to to say that whole Hebrew Bible stuff that's not part of our thing. Uh, the, the New Testament message, the message of the gospel, is different, and, and that means to be be left adrift, and even right up into the 20th century, uh, people like Lutman, you know, Lutman talking about the prologue of John's Gospel, and said, we, we don't know where this comes from, but uh, one thing we're sure of, it's not Jewish. <laughs> there's, there's hardly anything more Jewish than the, the prologue of John's Gospel, if, we, if we're honest about it. Uh, so, I, th I think we all suffer from this. We are trying to create kind of self-contained traditions uh, which think that they will save themselves by by isolating and, and standing on their own uh, their own feet. So I say uh, overall that my, my one question, uh, which is not a question that can be answered, but it's a question for all of us, is how can we read these texts uh, as all texts of a single tradition, not as univocal texts. The, the Quran has its own voice. The biblical tradition has its many voices as well, uh, but these are voices we need not be afraid of. Thank you. 
chosen to trust. And that's what faith of essential brings to me.
respond in. And it's something you mentioned, it's something really fascinating I haven't thought about it, that where were these Muslim scholars like Ahmed Shakir, Muhammad Abdul, Rashid Rilla, were they, um, were they in many ways responding to certain Orientalist scholars? Uh, Shakir, Ahmed Shakir doesn't quote any Orientalist scholars, but it, this is a great question to look at. Rashid Rilla, Muhammad Abdul, you know, do, are they quoting Orientalist scholars? Are they trying to respond? Are they trying to reject this notion that the Quran is a Christian text? Um, definitely a very fruitful point. And to kind of answer uh, Yushka's question, that I think this is a very fascinating point that he's so strong against this right And a lot of scholars, such as Norman Calvin and others, have noticed this and highlighted in their published articles, so saying that this was a very, this was a turning point in Islamic history when Kathir and Kathir were criticizing Jewish and Christian sources. But if you look closely at other places, they are actually incorporating them and making them part of their theological argument. So my understanding, I see Ibn Kathir is a historian first and foremost. So he was trying to understand Islam within, alongside, you know, with the biblical tradition. He doesn't see it as necessarily op, you know, opposing it uh, in any way. So he actually, even, there's parts of his Bidayu and Ahai where he actually talks about early Christian history and he situates himself with it. He says, yeah, there were certain Christians that didn't hold Jesus as divine. And we as Muslims are similar, exactly the same as so he's trying to understand the Islamic tradition within the Jewish and Christian history. So I think that's one point. The second point is, the second point is that he was in a milieu where there were Jews and Christians. So the fact that there were Arabic translations of the Bible, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Kathir had access to it. And this is in the mid medieval time, in the 14th century. I think demonstrates that there was a dialogue, some type of dialogue and discussion between these different groups. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah has a very famous reputation of Christianity do I have a sahih to men better than the sahih that the correct reply to those who change the religion of Christianity? And he once again quotes biblical material. And, and, to the, and it's definitely in, in the matter of polemic. You know, this was during the time of the later parts of the Crusades. There was these uh, polemics going back and forth between Jews and Christians. But there was a, a knowledge of each other's traditions, and there was, a, there was an attempt to kind of understand those uh, traditions in light of one another and in opposition. So, um, so that's, I think, another important point. This will have to be the last question. Yeah, I have a question for the end. Shane Holmes is a
Quran and my understanding through the Quran itself. That's something such as Zainab Almani mentioned earlier today. At the same time, there's you know, a, a part of me that totally agrees with and imagine in that we have to understand that there are precedents and we have to read certain passages from the Quran alongside or with the biblical material. So this is a, you know, a debate that I'm part of. Unfortunately, we're out of time at this point, but feel free to come up and ask your questions during the break. We will reconvene at the Fort Cromwell. Before we leave, let's, let's give them one.